The Orange Pi Zero is here. How good is it in comparison to the competition? Find out in this video. A man's work is never done. No matter if you're up a ladder or down on the ground. After every manly pursuit, you deserve something that will quench your thirst like no other. Grab a can of ice cold orange pie zero. Now with four core ingredients to slam it down fast and quench your thirst. Orange pie soda, now with zero support. The Orange Pi Zero is a board that aims to directly compete with the Raspberry Pi Zero and the chip being around the same price and with roughly the same features. The Orange Pi has a gruntier all-winner H2 MCU with four cores running at 1.2 GHz. This puts it ahead of the competition on CPU power alone. It's smaller in size than the others but consumes more power thanks to those four cores. It also has Wi-Fi and Ethernet but not Bluetooth. Four USB ports but only one with a socket and like its companions, doesn't have MIPI CSI or DSI support. It does, however, have 26 GPIOs in standard Pi format, but the all-winner H2 is capable of 384 GPIOs. Why only provide 26 of the darn things? I would have extended out the PCB and provided an additional three rows of GPIOs on two other sides, giving you an effective four times as many. They also made the other bad decision of not pushing out the MIPI CSI headers that the H2 is capable of. What? I mean really? Basically the all winner H2 can support so much more than has been provided on this PCB. Interestingly on the back side there is an unpopulated SMD which is for SPI flash memory. This will allow booting up without the need of an SD card but like so many other things kernel support for it isn't quite there yet. The Orange Pi Zero is fairly new and it shows on their website. I have a real issue with companies pushing out a product and expecting the community to provide software support. Their product page is fairly sparse, but there's a quick start guide which oh, okay, doesn't have the zero. There's a GitHub page, which isn't really what I want at this point, and a wiki which has nothing on the zero. Fortunately, they have provided a downloads page for the zero images. You can't actually get to any of the Google Drive images, but you can get to the Beidou Cloud link, which, uh, oh, oh, for heck's sake, Every single one of them is like this. Fortunately, the forums are quite extensive and questions like where the heck are the downloads gets you to this, which forces you to install a Firefox extension and you can download all the zero images. I also fetch the current and latest ambient images because frankly it has far better support across many SBCs. First of all, I tried the stock images provided by the Orange Pie people. Oh, by the way, the SD slot is one of those let's see how far across the room you can lose your SD card types. You know the ones. After you've found your SD card across the room, chuck in the Ethernet and the juice. Once powered up, it just sat there looking at me. Nothing. So I loaded up the current stable Ambien instead. Chucked it in, which saw some blinky lights. Excellent. The Zero started up and settled down to around 250 milliamp current draw. One of the other odd design decisions with this board is that it doesn't pass through the micro USB data lines to the MCU. Well, it seems to be there on the schematic, but it doesn't appear on your PC as a serial device. The chip does this, why can't the zero? The serial console is however pushed out to the 5V logic header pins, which is a bit of a hassle as you'll need a USB to TTL chip like the CP2102 to convert the levels. So the only other option is to log in via network. Once you've found your IP address, which I won't go into here, you can SSH into it. With Arbion, the first time you log in, it will initiate a reboot of the SBC. So just wait for it to come back up again. Once it's finished fiddling around, the board will drop to around 160 milliamps and the LEDs will stop blinking. This release of Arbion has a 3.4 base kernel, with all the ITC, SPI and GPI devices available to us, straight up. Nice. I'm beginning to like Arbion a fair bit now. So we have these two LEDs on board, which are accessible from Linux in the usual manner, and a bucket load of GPIOs, but of course only a handful are actually wired up. A real shame, all that waste. On top of the standard 26-pin Raspberry Pi header, there's also another header that provides all the extra USB lines 
TV out, audio and IR. Of course you'll need to solder up some headers to be able to access these 26 GPIOs. You can use a bit of old VeraBoard to keep the pins in place while soldering. The wires connected to the power and ground planes will actually need a bit of extra heat. Access to all the GPIOs as basic input-output works as expected, but things change when you get to things like ITC and SPI. It turns out the SPI and ITC buses aren't really supported in the kernel, so I tried an upgraded kernel, 4.83, which is very recent, altered the device driver table to enable ITC, and rebooted. Even though it was enabled, it never really worked. Damn, I'll have to leave SPI and ITC testing for another day. I'll be testing these in a review update. So to get it into some performance tests, I chucked in my external USB hard disk which contains all my SBC test software and mounted it up. I also installed RPI monitor so I could record CPU loading and temperature, which has a nice web interface you can use, but I stuck with the console version. So that I could compare all my test results, I recorded a baseline, which was a stock board with nothing running, using around 220 milliamps at full clock rate and sitting at 42 degrees Celsius. The ambient temperature was around 39.3, a typical Aussie December day. Then I started to load it up with a CPU test, which pushed the temperature to around 54 degrees Celsius at 300 milliamps current draw. I next tried a more rigorous CPU test, which caused the CPU to start to get hot just nudging 61 degrees Celsius and causing the clock rate to scale back. Overheating is a common issue with ARM chips. While the test was running, I chucked on a simple heatsink to see what difference it made, which saw it drop from a peak of 62 degrees Celsius down to 55. Note the sudden drop in temperature and then a rise. The reason for this is that heatsinks are just a way of dissipating heat energy. Since the copper was cold at the start, it sucked out the heat very efficiently, but then the temperature rose again. This is a good sign that the heatsink is not adequate enough. How about a fan to blow some air over it? I let the temperature settle down a bit and then hammered it again, which saw a peak of 45 degrees Celsius, but it was certainly a lot cooler. You could get away with a fanless heatsink only if your heatsink was large enough and had adequate ventilation around it. Incidentally, you can check out all the Phronix test results on the openbenchmarking.org website. Overall, the Orange Pi Zero performed fairly consistently across the board. John the Ripper, for example, saw it slightly slower than a Pi 3, but on par with an Odroid C1 and a Banana Pi M2, but beating the pants off the Pi Zero. All the other tests saw similar results, slightly varied, but similar. Some results, like flak encoding, saw it on par with a Pi 3. Next on to some Ethernet performance tests. I used iPerf 3 between a Mac Mini and a Zero, which saw around 94 megabits per second bandwidth. You can't argue with that and 0.2 millisecond jitter on UDP tests. It has no issues keeping up with Ethernet. Connecting over Wi-Fi works straight up using either WPA GUI or nm 2 e both connected without issue. Then ran iPerf 3 again using the stock aerial, 12.9 megabits per second, pretty good. Jitter increased to around 2.8 milliseconds, but that was to be expected. Then I tried it with no aerial, which completely bombed out. I couldn't connect to anything at all. So I tried a cheap PCB style aerial, which saw similar results to the stock aerial for bandwidth, and jitter increasing slightly to 3.2 milliseconds. Next I tried a decent aerial, which saw about the same results as a stock aerial for bandwidth, and also jitter. So it would seem the stock aerial does a pretty good job of things. So what do I think of the Orange Pi Zero? Well at this stage there seems to be a number of things that need fixing, like ITC and SPI support proper official images, and power over ethernet isn't really standard. It's a nice little hacker board, but it's not for someone wanting to get into SBCs. It has plenty of CPU power, but no MIPI bus. It is tiny, but they could have pushed out a lot more GPIOs, making it a lot more attractive. I'd give it an overall score of 3.9 out of 5. Thanks for watching this review of the Orange Pi Zero, and see you next week.